Hi, I'm Tom Rue of the Kauffman Foundation, and today on Top of Mind, we're going to take a stroll through the entrepreneurial journey of one of Kansas City's greatest entrepreneurs, Barnett Hellsberg Jr., former CEO of Hellsberg Diamonds. This is Top of Mind. Today on Top of Mind, I'm here with an icon of Kansas City, Barnett Hellsberg, former CEO of Hellsberg Diamond and founder of Hemp, the Hellsberg Entrepreneurship Mentoring Program. Barnett, thank you for joining us today on Top of Mind. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, um, it really is a treat for me, and I have to tell you because I get to meet entrepreneurs all over the world. But the distinction you have, at least as it relates to me, is you're the only person I know that's ever sold a company to Warren Buffett. And, you know, that guy knows a thing or two about entrepreneurship and has some business savvy. So, you know, I, I, have, to, uh, I have to laugh. Um, when I first saw your book, what I learned before I sold to Warren Buffett, you know, for those of you who have ever had this book, the, the funny picture that I really enjoy is there's a, on the cover, there's a picture of Barnett. Now, is it you're taking his wallet? Yes. Okay, so you're taking the wallet from Warren Buffett, um, which really says something, doesn't it? What were you thinking? What were you trying to say he with that? He has a great sense of humor, and we were shooting these pictures. And this one wasn't really for the book. He just said, I'm going to hand you my wallet. And, of course, that's the one they picked up for the cover of the book. So that was... Now, was it heavy? Like, could you hold on to it? It looks like... It <laughs> Barely. <laughs> well, you know, kidding aside, um, I think to get started for the episode today, if you wouldn't mind, um, could you share just a little bit of the story of Hellsberg Diamonds and, you know, how it is that you came to have that experience and, and eventually sell your company? Well, years? my grandfather started it in 1915, and I think I just figured out how he got enough money to start it. Uh, someone gave me a book about prohibition, and this is my theory. In the days of pro before Prohibition, uh, if you had $200, and he was a Russian immigrant, you could start a saloon if you would agree with a beer company to only buy their brand forever. They'd pay for everything. Silverware, the build-out, everything. Yeah. And he didn't like being in that business. I think he saved his money and was able to go in the jewelry business. So that's how he transitioned, and he did that around 1915. Right. And then from there, did it just, was it local? Was it one store? It was, was it? Kansas City, Kansas, a 15-foot wooden front. About three years later, he had a stroke, and my dad, believe it or not, at age 15, took over the business. Wow. And loved it. And he really broke a lot of the rules, normal he didn't just copy everybody, he had his own ideas and uh, really unique and quality ideas. And uh, actually, he was in business with his brother for a while, but my dad forgot the key to the store one day and his brother said, you're irresponsible. Anybody that wouldn't, would forget the key to the store, I don't want to be in business with. But they were great friends all their lives, but he didn't want to be in business with this irresponsible. So they split, they split yeah. off of that, just yeah. one absent-minded moment. So then they both had jewelry stores. My uncle moved to Wichita and had the Wichita store uh, there. Now, which brother had more commercial success? And I think I know the answer to that. Probably my dad, but my uncle was killed in 1934 in a car wreck. He was one of these people that drove like a maniac, and he always told my dad, a miss is as good as a mile. Well, it wasn't a miss. I was six months old, and it wasn't a miss, so wow. he died. And so my dad bought the store in Wichita, and so they were very young in those days. And really neat old ads, meet the Hellsberg boys, wear diamonds, and I mean, they really did neat things. Now, did they, you know, it, so at 15, you know, that's a, that's a heck of a thing to step into as a, a child. And I imagine that he matured very, very quickly. You know, how did he handle, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, 
you know, all the what we would perceive as the adult actions of managing a store, you know, from marketing, know. selling, well, and whatnot. You're talking about adult actions. He only told me about one or two things. One thing that was tough, and I think that was telling his uncle he had dirty fingernails when <laughs> he worked for him, and he always quoted that. Really? But uh, I don't know. He was a natural, I guess. It's just amazing to me. That's great. Um, you know, I, I think then at some point you come into the picture. You know, he eventually uh, gets married and starts having children. Was it something that you grew up with? So, you know, yes. you were around the school. Oh, yeah. Was... We, of course, talked about the dinner table. And I think one of the great favors he did us was have us work. And frankly, uh, some of my folks' friends thought it was just horrible. We'd come home for Christmas from college and We'd work. It's busy. That season. And, of course, we might go to a party and be there late. And I think some people thought that, well, I think was the greatest favor he ever did us. And why do you say that? Well, I think, you know, you grew up in a family with privilege, and you just have no idea. I'll never forget the nicest lady in the world, but I just thought, People couldn't be this nice. She was no phony. The quality of people, and you learn about people, and you just get to appreciate uh, working people, or whatever you call them. And also, frankly, I was a very timid kid, and all of a sudden I found out I could sell, and I started to get some confidence, and that's what I love, and that's a, almost every, all I'm good at, I think, today. And uh, so I just loved it. You know, we've talked, uh, we know each other, you know, outside of uh, taping things like this, and I know personally that selling and, and selling skill is a passion of yours. Um, you know, maybe for the benefit of the viewers watching this um, uh, interview, you know, can you expand on your philosophy around that? Why, especially from an entrepreneurial perspective, is that selling experience important in the arc of a company, especially as it related to growing Hellsberg? Well, there's a new book called uh, To Sell is Human. Daniel Pink wrote the book, and he said, if you ask 10 people who's in selling, one will hold their arm up. Then he did research, 40% of life, all of us, is selling. It's just vital. And I think to be able to project yourself into the mind of other people and maybe help them and not just think of what they think you're going to do. I'm, one of my favorites was I'm showing a ring set. One is 1,200 and one is 1,000. And they said to me, which one looks better on her hand? And I said, the $1,000 one. I think they were probably surprised they'd try to up. But it did look better. And, of course, I was very happy. That was a very big sale in those days. But I think instead of just thinking, how am I going to get more money out of you if I want to help you? Right. And serve you. And obviously, it's a very happy business, as my dad called it. And my mother by coincidence, my stars were lined up. My mother's father was a retail jeweler on Main Street in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, my yeah. dad's father is a retail jeweler in Kansas City, Kansas on Minnesota Avenue. So my stars were pretty tightly lined up. I don't think they ever knew each other. It's just a you know, wonderful business because people are coming in, they're happy. Uh, this is not a new refrigerator. This right. is something you want to buy and you want to show someone you love them. It's an elective for so sure. It's a very emotional, exciting business. So here's, you know, I was listening to you answer that question and what rang in my ears was authenticity. You know, yeah, it's probably in your interest to recommend the $1,200 ring set, but you said the, the $1,000 ring set because it looked better. It did look better. And you know, and it's been my experience in my own companies that authenticity is a hard thing to fake. 
and salespeople or just you know professionals in general that try to fake it can rarely pull that off. And people are very smart of every age and they know when it's not authentic. Yeah, I, I, I would believe you on that, and I, I get that. So, you know, so you had this kind of authenticity, this ethos in your company. You're right, it's a happy industry, right? I mean, I'm buying in for engagements and, and holidays, and, you know, what's not to love about that business? So I'm sure that was a factor in the, you know, the growth of Hellsberg. You know, like, how, you know, how long, and what was that arc, that journey like, that you were growing it to no, the point that you, that you sold? We took a lot of wrong turns. Really? And uh, I think we might have been pretty close to going out of business, but I didn't understand accounting enough to know that. Uh, we went into, we had a lease in one of the very first covered malls in the country, Ward Parkway Shopping Center, Kansas City, Missouri. And we were so smart, we had a clause that if you don't build it in two years, we can walk away. And frankly, my dad was ill and the attitude wasn't. And without agonizing, we pulled out. And we had downtown stores, they were going downhill. And we were just struggling. Christmas was miserable because, it, you know, every year the downtowns were going down. And so then, because of some competitors that had done it, we made another great error and wasted years of progress. We went into the licensed department in discount stores, running jewelry departments. And some made money, some didn't. You didn't control your destiny. And now, I'm always extremely lucky. How were we lucky? We sold all but two of those, but we had about 39 stores and departments. I think we closed 38 of them. We had to transition the whole company over to shopping centers. But uh, one day we went to the uh, bank and the suppliers in our industry would try to load you up and say, you don't need to pay till January 10th, don't worry about it. And January 10th came, we mailed out the checks. And of course, with great forethought on January 11th, we went to the bank. Well, I had a letter that said, you can have $500,000. I didn't read the last paragraph very well. It said you had to have some kind of good shape. Right. And the bank turned us down. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, you can be a failure too, just because you were raised in a fancy house and all this. You can be a failure, and my heart is pounding. Well, I learned always have two suppliers. So we went over to Kansas City, Kansas. The Bridenthal's had backed my dad forever. And their question was, how much do you need? It took about 60 seconds to make a loan. So they saved our company. We'd have ruined ourselves. So... Uh, that was a very valuable experience. You know, I, I'm glad you share that because, uh, again, in, in my capacity, I get to have conversations like this. And, you know, so what I heard you um, articulate is a fairly common experience that successful entrepreneurs have, and that is not confusing cash flow with profitability. You know, I, I bet at the time of January 10th, when you even shipped out the checks, probably on paper you were profitable, but if you can't cover the float, I you really, close the doors. I, I'm not an accountant, but as far as I'm concerned, all that matters is cash. Create right. cash. That's the business, not profit. Another mistake I want to talk about is a great example of an emotional person making an emotional decision without enough agony and diligence and almost destroying the future of the company. Wow. And here it was. So we went into a mall that was not a good mall in Denver area. And my dad and Max Gear, our real estate man for 50 years, they wanted to go in. And the deal was ridiculous. It was so good. They built the store. They did everything. I didn't want to go. P.S. 
store was a great success and we had an exclusive. In those days we thought we want to be alone in the mall. Our competitor built a store in spite of our lease and we, I, we sued the landlord and the competitor. Now why was that wrong? Here's why it was wrong. Facts don't really matter. What matters is how people feel. We could have been blacklisted in the entire landlord community from doing that, and some people were, and never gotten another store in a mall or a good mall. Wow. So I risked the entire future of the company with a very emotional, dumb decision. So at, at what point do you get to critical mass, and I don't know how many stores that is, that you start saying, you know what, maybe I can find somebody that wants to buy this from well, me. Well, it really wasn't how many stores, it was uh, what I saw happening. I saw myself getting lazy. I saw myself I not, find that hard to believe for the not time living I've on you. airplanes like I had before, because between... Uh, looking for new locations and visiting stores, I was gone a lot. And uh, frankly, what I saw happening in the future was tremendous escalating of real estate rents and a difference in the risk-reward ratios. Uh, my dad had a lot more courage than I had, and he w had paid $30,000 a couple of places. And when I started making these ten or fifteen thousand dollars versus five percent, well, the figures are astronomical now, and I knew it was coming. I couldn't grow up to the modern world, and I just thought the whole risk reward ratio was different. So those were some of the things. I, I wonder, you know, for a lot of people that have this journey, they have a, a partner, a significant partner that's part of that journey. I happen to know a little bit about you and that you have a, a significant partner in your wife and how she influences a lot of the things in, in your life in decision making. You know, is there, was there a role there? I mean, I have to imagine you know, she was... Truthfully, and I don't know what you'd say today, she wasn't happy about, she really had tremendous feelings as I did, but the family business. And uh, I don't think she was thrilled with it. Of course, I brought my sons and my wife into some of the selection when we talked to Morgan Stanley and these different people. So I, uh, I don't think she, I know she was not thrilled at that time and... Uh, Yet you still went ahead with that decision. Yeah, I did and I probably, I was right about my predictions and the difficulties, but I probably didn't put enough agony in to it. You know, um, as I think of your life trajectory and the success that you had with Hellsberg Diamonds, and here we sit, you know, in the Coffin Foundation, the house that Mr. K built, you know, who had a, a similarly successful rise and the experience that he had, you know, in entrepreneurship uh, afforded his intention to live out in the legacy of the foundation. I know you are very passionate now about you know giving back or paying forward. Um, you know the second book I have here is really a tool set that we use in your organization. You know the Hellsberg Entrepreneurship Mentoring Program. Mentoring I know is a big big passion for you. Um, perhaps you can you know help us understand why you see that in such a priority lens that you do, and, and what drives you to support a program like Hemp. Uh, well, as you know, Mr. Kaufman was one of my mentors, and your foundation actually backed our startup financially as well as emotionally. Uh, well, I think the proof has been in the pudding. Uh, if you read this book, you'll see that we have created jobs, we've actually saved companies, and we're active people, I mean, these mentors, and uh, frankly, 
after being in one business 39 years, it gives me exposure to a lot of exciting, fun businesses. And uh, I don't consider it giving back. I consider it selfishness because I have so much fun out of it. And frankly, it's more fun than hanging out with my contemporaries with their new knees and their new hips and all these things. So it's very, very exciting. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not surprised. And obviously, um, I haven't mentioned yet on this interview, but I will now. You know, I have the privilege of serving on the hemp board. Um, it really wasn't even a, a hesitation when you asked me to join because the work uh, the group has been doing has been so great. Uh, and I agree, you know, it's, it's a really a big way to give back. You know, when I look at the potential that mentoring has to un unlock this kind of latent potential that's in the economy, uh, it's enormous. Well, I look at it as a renewable, non-polluting, underused resource. And it's there, and it, it's created jobs, it's saved companies, I mean, the stories are absolutely amazing. So it's just like it's there, and we need to use it. And there's a lot of people that are anxious to help. Here at the, at the Kauffman Foundation, we're obviously very passionate about entrepreneurship. We study it, we promote it, we celebrate it. Um, and I know you know this because you participate in some of the programs like One Million Cups that are here. So I have to think now, um, Back when you know you were building the Hellsberg Empire, and maybe you didn't even consider the title of entrepreneur, but you certainly were, because long before the word was in common use, the, the concept, the, the, the people that were, existed. How would you compare and contrast like what the entrepreneurial environment was then to what you see it today? You just can't even compare it, because you have limitless resources, and people to talk to and people to share the ups, the downs and help you understand that it's not easy. They're going to have a lot of surprises. Failure is a big part of success and uh, I just think it's a wonderful time for entrepreneurs. Well today on Top of Mind we had Barnett Hellsberg in Barnett, I just want to thank you again. What a, what a great opportunity it's been to have you in the seat, so to speak. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing. I mean, it's just it's decades worth of advice um, that's just not easy to come by. And you know, it's been a real thrill for me to get to know you and to serve on your board at Hemp and to see how you've interacted with the, you know, the ecosystem here in Kansas City. Thank you. Well, I just hope there's benefit here for the people watching, and especially in these errors I made. I hope they can avoid them. Well, let's hope that they will.